so good to see everybody. How are you guys doing? Welcome to church. Man, it is just a good morning today. Feeling all the feelings. We're in this series called Feelings. Feelings. What are we feeling this morning? A lot of emotions, a lot of feelings happening. Our home, there's seven of us. Uh, And so Sunday mornings can be a bit overwhelming in our house (laughs) because everybody is built differently. We're all wired differently. We all have emotions and feelings. And one of our children has actually moved out. He's lives far away, but sometimes we can still feel his presence and we can still feel his emotions because that's just how it is. Big families, it's just, it's just how it is. But feelings, I, I love this topic of feelings. I, I love talking about them. I don't always like talking about my own. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people don't. And so it can be one of those topics that is like, okay, well, what are we going to talk about? How does this pertain to my life? Yes, I have feelings. I don't always like uh, admitting it, but we have them. And just because you don't like talking about them doesn't mean that they don't happen. There's highs and lows of life. It's sometimes like a roller coaster of emotion. And the world can often tell us how to feel. Do you feel that way? Like you watch TV for five minutes and it's like they tell you how you should feel, how you should like that food, how you should like that halftime show, how you should like that game, how you should like that TV show, how you should feel about life. And I found that the world can sometimes bully us into feeling a certain way. But that's not what God's word tells us. And in our home, when the, when the emotions are high and everyone's feeling it, you know, the whole house comes up to whatever emotion is feeling. It's feeling. If you live alone, you might feel like, okay, I am personally on this journey and, and, and I feel these feelings and nobody else knows about them. And, and so it can, it can isolate us. It can, it can make us feel tired. Feelings can make us feel alone. They can make us feel angry. All of these things. Our feelings make us feel. Like even today, talking about this message, I'm like, whenever I talk about feelings, I feel like I get all up in my own feelings. Like I'm like, today I just feel a little blah. And, you know, I just had my first coffee of the day. So we don't know. We don't know how this is going to go. We don't know. But I'm glad you're in for the ride along with me. Feelings and emotions of life. And I love the movie Inside Out. Anybody ever seen Inside Out? If you haven't, it's a Disney movie. So cute about a little girl. And all of her feelings turn into these fluffy little creatures inside of her head. And I love it. I love the movie. And it's like anger, disgust, and, uh, and happy and sad. And sad is my favorite character of the movie. And there's this line that sadness says. And she says, remember that super funny movie where the dog died? I love that line because that's so life. It's so life. There's so many feelings and emotions of life, and they can coexist. In some of the most sad and difficult times of my life, I've been able to laugh at things. And when things are great, Brian and I were just we're doing great. Our kids are all listening. It's life is good, and you know we've had family time, and we're praying together, and life is just firing on all cylinders. I've been sitting in rooms crying for no apparent reason, because feelings and emotions they coexist, and there's ups and there's downs. And and the thing is, is if you live for like five minutes, you recognize or seen the movie Inside Out, um, you know that happiness exists because of sadness. And we need all of these feelings, but we live in this world that tries to tell us how to feel, bullies us, but it also chases happiness. Have you noticed that? The world chases happiness. I'll sit down with people and they'll say, well, I just want my kids to be happy. I'm just not feeling happy anymore in this relationship. It doesn't make me happy. And we live in this world that kind of chases this this idea of happiness, but I don't know if they define it. (laughs) Like, when have we arrived? When are we happy? Is this like something, happiness? Do we put it in quotation marks? And, And the world kind of just tells us, like, do more of what makes you happy and less of what makes you sad. Sounds simple enough. Like, we're like, okay. I got this, like today I'm gonna get up and do the things that make me happy. 
you have to go to work. Dang it. <laughs> like, right? Like, we're already, like, feel like we're losing before we even start. And some days work is so fun. And some days work is not so fun. And some days in the middle of your day, you can experience fun and happiness and sadness and frustration and anger and bitterness and loneliness and tiredness and, and then excitement and, and all in the same like breath sometimes. <laughs> like you can feel this roller coaster of feelings and emotions. And so how do we be happy in a world that's chasing happiness but doesn't tell us what it is? How do we as Christ followers find happiness I think the Bible kind of lays out some exact things for us throughout God's word. The world kind of tells us one thing, and oftentimes I find that God's word tells us another. <laughs> Have you noticed that? The world says, hey, here's happiness, and God's word says, no, 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 let me tell you what true happiness is. And that's difficult to understand, especially when you're, you're, you, you're, you're human. You've grown up in this, in this world, and you have all these feelings and emotions, and you don't always know how to handle them. And, and you think, well, if I eat that cake, it'll make me happier. If I buy that house, it'll make me happier. If I find that right spouse, it'll make me happier. And we chase and we chase and we spin and we turn. And God's word is pretty clear. It's like, hey, you don't have to chase happiness. Here, let me define it for you. I think the first thing God's word tells us is to ask for help. I do not like to ask for help. <laughs> but God's word kind of tells us how important this is. If you kind of thumb through the pages of scriptures, you find all of these characters. Think of a few. Moses, David, Elijah, Jeremiah, like all of these pages of scripture. Job, you're like, man, those guys, like we want to be more like Jesus, but these guys we read about through the scriptures, like David, a man after God's own heart. I want to be like that guy, right? Peter, he got to walk with Jesus. He had an anger problem. David, a man after God's own heart, he was messed up. He did some crazy things, and, and he was also dealing with deep despair. He lived his life in kind of anguish. He would often, like, he just always, you read through, he was like ripping his clothes and sackcloths and ashes and all kinds of crazy things. It's like, this guy, he was struggling. It was difficult for him. Elijah, throughout the Bible, prophet, he's a great man of God. He was weary and afraid, the Bible tells us. Jeremiah, prophet, he was known as the weeping prophet. Job, sad guy. Lots of bad things happened to that guy, Job. Everything that happened to him, you read through his, he's got a whole book of the Bible, some sad stories in there. But Job, he, he infected him emotionally, physically, spiritually. You look through the pages of scripture, you're like, man, God, you have all these stories in the Bible, all these characters, and we're supposed to learn from them and, and be like them and be more like Jesus. And Jesus was a man of great sorrow. He sat in the garden and he sweat blood. Feelings, emotions, we have them. I have them, you have them. It's not about when or how or how much. It's, it's about how we deal with them. And I wanna take a moment and, and kind of in this space and, and talk about something that's a little deep and a little dark and it's called depression. And in a room this size, you know, two experiences, all those watching online, you know, statistics tell us there's a lot of depression in our world today and a lot sitting in our churches. And it's something we don't talk about a lot because we want to hide it. <laughs> and we want to pretend like it's not happening. We don't want to talk about our feelings because our feelings are hard. We don't want anyone to think less of us. We don't want them to think that we're crazy or too messed up or, or that God doesn't love us. But depression, statistics tell us that only one third of people dealing with depression actually seek help. We have to ask for help. And it's so sad because only one third of people dealing with depression ask for help, but then statistics tell us about 80 to 90% who actually seek help say that it helps. So why? Why? 
Why are all these men in the Bible, why do they deal with these things? Why do we deal with these things? Why do we hold on to? And if I've learned anything in the 41 years of my life, it's that I wish I would have talked about my feelings sooner. (laughs) I wish I would have talked about how I'm feeling so that I can move past some things, so that I could heal, so that I could let God work on these things. And a lot of times we try to keep it in the dark. I'm ashamed of that. I don't like that. It doesn't look good on paper. And God says, hey, bring it to the light so that Jesus can work on it. All these people, all these guys, they dealt with it too. And and so many times I've found that when I reach out for help, hey, hey, I'm going through this. So many times I've had people look right back at me and say, me too. I've gone through that too, or I'm going through it right now, or I haven't gone through that exactly, but I've gone through this. And I've sat down with so many people that have talked about how, you know, growing up, they just don't talk about how they feel. You just live and you smile and everything's perfect and happy. And, and somewhere along the line, we've decided that the, the way to be is the, the, the white picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the, and the dog and the boat in the garage. And all those things are so great, but they're just on the outside. They're not on the inside of who we are, we have to ask for help. I don't love that. I I feel like I got this. Anybody else? Like you're like, I got this. I got this. I can do all those things in one day. I've got this. I can deal with that feeling. I can deal with that emotion. I can deal with that bad habit all by myself. I've got this. And what it is is a whole bunch of pride. (laughs) A whole bunch of pride to not ask for help parents in the house. Man, I'm having a difficult time with my toddler. Man, these teenagers suck. I guess rough. I need some help. I know that's a bad word, but sometimes they just do. And, and so you're like, man, in parenting, sometimes you don't want to ask for help. You don't want to reach out and ask because you don't want them to think you're a bad parent. You, you don't want them to know how bad your kids are when you're not in public. You know, in public, you got it under control. You're like, sit down, be quiet, shh. Don't hold your hands like that. Put them down. You look like a weirdo. Like, don't be weird. Don't be weird. Stop being weird. And in public, you got like an hour to look normal and like you got it all together on the outside in front of your neighbors, in front of the people in your life, in front of your church. And then you you go home and it's like, wah, crazy town. And, and, And we have to be talking about these things. Statistics also tell us that two thirds of every suicide are depression related. And we don't talk. And we hold it in and we say, don't be weird in public and sit down and be quiet and act normal. And what is normal anyway? (sighs) Guys, we need freed from this. We need freed from this idea that we have to be a certain way and act a certain way and do a certain thing. There's freedom in Jesus. Ask for help. Psalm 43, 5. King David's talking, remember? A little messed up. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Isn't that like what normal life is like? Oh, why am I so sad? Why am I so discouraged? But God is good, amen? Praise Jesus. And, and, and that is so true. He is. But how many times do we do that? In the moment when you are feeling discouraged, when your soul is weary, when you are going through something difficult, how many times do you switch and go, but God, you're good. And I'm gonna praise you, my savior and my God. And in that moment when the the roller coaster is going, how many times do we stop ourselves? Ask for help, take it to Jesus, decide to praise him because we do need to ask for help, but we also need to take some praise breaks. Some praise breaks sometimes. How often do you give yourself a break? We're so hard on ourselves. We're so hard on ourselves. You don't have that right. You didn't do that correctly. They're going to think that you, you're messed up. Don't, don't do that. We're so hard on ourselves. And, and we're not able to be ourselves. <laughs> we need some praise breaks and we need them often. I have to worship. I have to have time alone with God. There is something that happens in the presence of Jesus. There is something that changes in the presence of Jesus. And I am blown away 
I'm blown away by how many people come into church on a Sunday and they have this great opportunity to praise Jesus. They have this great, the lights are low, the music is loud. You don't have to put your hands in and not look weird and sit down and be quiet because no one else is. But I am blown away how many people come in and miss this moment. I don't know what's going on in your head. Maybe you feel like you don't want to look weird. Maybe you feel like, okay, this is, not, this is not my personality. I don't have this personality. And I'm not talking about jumping around and shouting loud. You don't have to do that. I, I'm just talking about something. God, you're good. You're good. Maybe I'm going to give a little wave. Maybe I'm going to tap my toe. Maybe I'm going to close my eyes or clap my hands or raise my hands to Jesus. Praise breaks all through the day. I need them. You need them. We need them. Because when we're praising Jesus, we're raising our hands. And if you've never done it, I would highly encourage you to because it's a sign of surrender. It's saying, Jesus, it's not about me. It's all about you. And as we chase this thing called happiness and we're taking these, these praise breaks, we need times where we're saying, it's not about me. It's all about you. How often do we live our lives with the me, 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 me's and the I, 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 I's. It's all about me. It's all about what I need. It's all about how I feel. It's about me. And you talk about feelings and, and digging deep. And, and yes, the hard heart work is often not just focus on me. It's focus on Jesus. Because I love feelings and emotions because it makes us who we are. It makes us decide like what we're about and our, our opinions and what we want to fight for. And if you look on Facebook for five seconds, you can see what people want to fight for and what their opinions are and what they're all about. And is it about your church? Is it pointing people to Jesus? I'm not just talking about on Facebook, I'm talking about our lives. When we take a moment to put all of the attention and time on Jesus, it changes, changes us. Praise changes us. It changes our hearts. In the book of Psalms, David also said, hey, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Joy comes from our salvation, who Jesus has made us, but also what he's done for us. Restore, make new, bring it back. The world tells us to be happy and Jesus says, hey, I have joy for you. Joy, it's better than happiness. It's true joy. Let praise change your heart. Did you know the enemy cannot attack you when you're praising Jesus? He can't attack you when you praise Jesus. The Bible tells us that he inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits. He is with us. He is in it. When we're praising Jesus, the enemy can't touch us. The enemy's very real. And he's always looking for something to mess us up. But when we take the focus off ourselves and we put it on Jesus, hands off. He can't mess with us in that moment. We have to take some praise breaks. Ephesians 1.3 says, let us give thanks to God, all praise to God who has blessed us, who has blessed us. When we give praise to God, we're thanking God. Oftentimes we'll think of thankfulness as a like one week in November type of thing. And we're like, write it on a card, put it in a jar. Thank you, Jesus. Fill our tummies. And we love you, Lord. Thank you. Gratitude and thankfulness is not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. Praise God. Thank him. Praise breaks. We need them. I need them. You need them. Praise breaks. It's a lifestyle. Gratitude. A few weeks ago, I talked in E-Kids. Give it up for the E-Kids. And we talked about gratitude. And I said, it's a lot like show and tell. Remember that cool thing you took to show and tell? I do. I was an only kid. I had a lot of things to take to show and tell. But it's a lot like show and tell. Gratitude is not just telling someone thank you. It's telling them thank you and then showing them you care. Show and tell. Gratitude. Not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. Something will change in your heart and your mind when you start praising God, thanking him for who he is, and then showing him you care. 
showing, showing him that it's not just all about you. It's about other people in your life. It's about Jesus. You've heard that old school acronym, joy, Jesus, others, you. Like it still works. It's not just like something for Sunday school. It's, it still works today. Jesus, others, you. There's an order in our hearts and in our minds to get the most out of us, to get the best out of us. We focus on Jesus first, other people, and then ourselves. Gratitude. Gratitude is something that starts in our hearts and then comes out of our mouths. Gratitude is a lifestyle. Now, I gave them a challenge in eKids, and now it's your turn. Gratitude challenge, being thankful, regular basis, not just on Thanksgiving. Okay, can we do it? Gratitude challenge, saying thank you because. This is what I told the kids. Thank you because. It elevates your thank you. We're really good at thank yous. Thank you so much. We'll send a card, maybe a gift card, a little texty. Thank you so much. Uh, sometimes just like T-Y. What does that mean? T-Y. Thank you. We're so good at thank you, but then showing someone that we care, saying thank you because to your spouse. Think how that would elevate your thank you. Thank you so much for taking care of that. Because you did that, I was able to get my other things done. Thank you, friend, for sending that text message. I was in a low spot. And that text message, because you sent it, it really, it helped my heart. Thank you because. I'm thankful for my home because. Thankful for my church because. Thankful for Jesus because he changed my heart. He changed my life. He set me free. Thank you because I'm thankful for my school, because my teacher, because it elevates the thank you. It's not just about saying thank you. We can do that. It's easy. It costs us nothing. Sometimes we forget. That's a whole nother message. But thank you because it, it shows your heart. Hey, Brian, thank you for that message you preached this weekend. This is what I got out of it. Because you preached that, I was able to talk to my neighbor. Because you preached that, it changed something in my heart, made me more thankful. Thank you because it's a challenge because it's not always easy. Sometimes I don't want to be content with what I have. God, thank you for my home. It's warm, but that's about it. Really could use a new kitchen, but whatever, right? It's difficult to be thankful sometimes. It's difficult to be content with what we have. A gratitude challenge is because it's difficult. God, thank you for my job, I guess. But thank you for my job because it pays my bills. Thank you for my job because I found some really great friends there. Thank you because. We need to ask for help. We need to take some praise breaks, be thankful but then we also need to commit to be content. And I really do think that the gratitude thing, the gratitude challenge, when we live a lifestyle of thankfulness, it really does make us more content. And it's a commitment. It's not something that we are just born doing. Like we're not just born one day, super content and happy with everything we have in life. Like, oh my gosh, my life is so great. Normally we say that when everything is going great, but when we have like a leaky pipe and a bad kitchen and we want a new car and our job just gave us a demotion or whatever it is, we're like, Bleh, everything sucks. But when we live a life of gratitude and we're like, okay, the, the pipe is busted, I need a new kitchen, I want a new car, I don't like my job, but I'm paying my bills and I'm thankful for what God's given me and I love my spouse and my kids are good most days and you start thinking of all the things that you have in your life, you're a lot more content. It's a commitment. It is not always easy to live a life of gratitude and have a gratitude attitude. It is not always easy to live a life of contentment and it is not always easy to ask for help. These things are difficult. We all know Philippians 4.13. Let me remind you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a great verse. It pumps you up. You're like, yeah. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you go a couple verses before, he's talking about how bad his life has been. And he's like, but you know what? All of this, Philippians 4.11, I have learned. 
I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. The busted pipe, the broke down car, the situation, whatever I have, I have learned how to be content. It's something we have to learn how to do. Did you know? Did you know that when comparison shows up, it is the quickest way to kill any contentment that you have ever had. <laughs> How quickly you get that brand new car to you car, but then you see someone else drove one off the lot and you're like, oh, I want that one. No joke, okay, this is serious. This is a real story. We brought our brand new van home a couple years ago. Was that like 16, I don't know, a couple years ago. I literally drove it home. I had a kid in a car seat. I gave him like a shake or something. Puked everywhere all over my brand new car. And we have this nice little like mats, but it went between the seat. And I was like, well, there goes my <laughs> new to me car and it's fine, everything's fine. Clean up the puke, everything's good. That's what moms do, but, <laughs> and dads, but things are not new forever. <laughs> and what you have has to be okay with you. The quickest way to kill something is to compare it to something else. Comparison kills good things. When comparison shows up, contentment ends. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. The darkest days that you have, it's so easy to compare to what someone else has. But the thing is, is that we usually compare it to what we scroll through and see. Right? Like, oh man, my kid's really struggling in school, but their kid's getting straight A's. Oh man, I don't want to go to work today. But their job took them to Florida. <laughs> I want to go to Florida. And we just scroll through and we see all these happy families and happy things and happy couples and happy lives. And we feel like we're missing out on something, but we don't know what it is that we really want. How do we live happy lives? Stop comparing them to other people's lives. Stop comparing them to what other people have. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this to ourselves? <laughs> because we're human. We make mistakes. We have bad days. We have feelings. We have emotions. We struggle with things. But we have to ask for help. We have to take praise breaks. We have to commit to being content. These situations, these things, just because I have a depressed feeling does not mean that I am a depressed person. Just because I have an anxious feeling does not mean that I'm clinically ha have an issue. But here's the deal, some people do. In a size room this, this size, th there are people who have clinical issues. There are others who are dealing with things. Either way, clinical or not, it's always a good time to go see a counselor, a therapist is always a good time. I've sat through so many sessions in therapy uh, with others for myself and, and listened and I'm like, these people are so smart. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so smart. I wish I would have thought of that. But they went to school like they for a long time. <laughs> so that's why they're so smart. And they, they, they can help you. They can help you. 80 to 90% say when they sought out help, they said it helped. Imagine that. It's not rocket science. It doesn't have to be difficult. No one is sitting there judging you or thinking that you are less than, than, than a, another person. No one is sitting there judging you thinking you are any less of a Christian. Yeah. Therapy is helpful. Talk to someone. I, I, just this week, gathering some information. We have resources for you. Reach out. Ask for help. This is a commitment. This is not always easy. Let's talk for just a few quick minutes about emotional maturity. We throw that out a lot. Let's be emotionally mature about this. What does that mean? Emotional maturity means that you can accept criticism and learn from it. Emotional maturity means that you recognize that your thoughts and actions and what you do affects other people, positively or negatively. Emotional maturity means that you can handle what you're going through not always by making it better, but talking about it and getting help, asking for help. Emotional maturity is not about how old you are. We will be working on emotional maturity for the rest of our lives. But don't do it without Jesus. <laughs> don't do it without Jesus. Otherwise, you'll just be 
trying to fix yourself. And we can't fix ourselves. I can't fix me. You can't fix me. I can't fix Brian. I can't fix my kids. I can't fix you. Jesus can. But you use a word like fix and that makes you feel broken and bad. Jesus talks about broken. He says he needs broken people. Broken people to come before him, surrender to him. He heals that. He, he, he br you bring it to the light and he works on it. He challenges you. He makes you new. He makes you better. He is what holds us together. He is what keeps us together. It's not about how old you are. It's about who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Psalm 139.15. Oh, yes. You shaped me first inside, then out. You know me inside and out. You know exactly how I was made from nothing into something. How often do we try to make ourselves into something? Make ourselves into what we think is something. We work so hard and we try so hard and he knows you inside and out. From the beginning of time, he knows you, he made you. We try so, so hard. But Zechariah 4, 5 tells us that it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He holds us together on the good days. He holds us together on the bad days. He holds us together when it's difficult, when we're struggling, when we feel depressed, when we feel anxious, when we feel frustrated, when we don't know which way to go, when we're confused, when we're hurting, when we're lost, when we're tired, when we're lonely, when we're bored. He holds us together. He holds us together in the midst of it all. All through the pages of scripture, we see these characters struggling, highs and lows of life, depressed, despair, deep, deep sorrow. They were all struggling with something very deep inside of them. But here's the thing, we would not have a Bible if they did not talk about it. We would not have God's word. It would not be full of all these stories if they didn't open up and share how they were feeling. They cried out to God. They laid it all on the line. They said, God, I can't go one step further without you. Some of them had lost everything that they had ever owned, everything that their life was about, they lost. But the thing is, is no matter what they were dealing with, no matter what they were going through, no matter if it was a high, high or a low, low or somewhere in between, God was with them. God was with them. He was there. He, he was leading the way and he was holding them together. He's a good God. Even on the darkest days, he didn't condemn them for, for their questions and their pain. He didn't tell them to get it together or man up or woman up or pull up their big girl pants, they didn't tell him any of those things. He, he, didn't, he didn't just tell him to tough it out. He reached down. He reached down into the deepest, deepest point and he was with them. Suffering, despair, sadness, happiness. He was there. He's always there. He shows compassion, he offers mercy, he gives grace, he forgives us, he forgives us, he forgives us, he forgives us. <laughs> Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You're weak, he's strong. His joy equals my strength. Without him, I'm nothing. Without him, I, I have no joy. Without him, I will chase happiness with the rest of the world in all the wrong places. But with him, I have joy. With him, I have peace. With him, I have grace. With him, I have mercy and love and an abundant life. Ask for help. Take some breaks. Praise Jesus and commit to be content because when you do, you'll find more of what makes you happy and less of what makes you sad. When you do, you'll find Jesus. The world says one thing, Jesus says another. <laughs> a lot of times, focus on what Jesus says because the greatest truth is this, we have a savior. We have a savior in Jesus. He heals every pain, he rights every wrong. 
Jesus went to a cross, he died for you and for me and he sets us free. And when we focus on that, it doesn't matter how low the low is or how high the high is, it evens us out because our Savior, He comes, He holds us together, He gives us that grace and that peace to keep us going no matter what, no matter what. Father God, we come to You in this moment. We praise You, we thank You. God, help us to have gratitude attitudes. Help us to thank You no matter what because You're with us no matter what. Father God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he came to earth, lived a life, had human feelings and emotions for us, for me, for every person in this room and every person listening online. And if you need to make sure, if you need to start a relationship with Jesus in this place, it's as simple as a prayer. Maybe it's been a long time since you've talked to him. Maybe you've not recognized in your life that, that you've sinned, that you've made mistakes and that you need a savior. You need Jesus. Jesus is the only way. The Bible tells us he's the way, the truth and the life and that no one comes to the father except through him. But we have to humble ourselves. We have to surrender to him. And I'm gonna pray a prayer in a moment, a prayer of salvation. If you need salvation in this place, that's where true joy comes from. And Jesus wants to save you, your heart, your life today in this moment. The prayer is not what saves you, it's Jesus. But as we pray this prayer, if you need to, to, to start that relationship, if you want to, to have Jesus in your heart and in your life, I just ask you to raise your hand if you need to be included in this prayer. Thank you so much and I will pray. God, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for reaching down from heaven to love on us. Thank you that Jesus came, that he was broken, that he was bruised and he was beat and that his blood was shed so that we could truly live. So God, I pray for every person in this room, if someone's here and they need to start that relationship with you, that they would just pray this prayer. Say, God, I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for saving me. I wanna walk into my future with you leading the way. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, amen. Church, let's give it up for all those.